Okay, so this is the uh, second uh, part of our urinary elimination uh, lecture, and we're going to start with kidney stones. And when we start with stones, um, I don't want you to think of the little rocks that you see or little pebbles that you see down at the ocean, you know, that are nice and polished and smooth. What I want you to think of are real jagged, sharp rocks, and it will help you to um, make sense of the pathophysiology and the pain that this person is going to uh, experience. And if you look at the pictures there, you can see agony and pain and misery. And that's what these these stones feel like as they go through the uh, ureter and through the uh, the urinary tract and it, it causes extreme pain. Okay, now to understand the pathophysiology, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my childhood here. And when I was a little kid, we used to make rock candy or, or uh, you know, sugar crystals. And um, it describes perfectly uh, the uh, pathophysiology of urolithiasis or kidney stones. When we used to make rock candy, what we'd do is we'd stick a little pan with water in it on the stove and you heat it up and you would dissolve sugar in the solution. You'd keep dumping sugar in until no more sugar dissolved and you would make a super saturated sugar solution. And then what you would do is you'd take that solution, put it into a jar, and then in, in the jar, usually across the top, there would be a little string, and on that string you'd put one sugar crystal. And then uh, you would let it sit overnight, and what happens is all the sugar in solution would stick to that little sugar crystal and would form large sugar crystals. And the next morning and the next day you would see uh, huge uh, crystals of sugar and and we would call that rock candy and you'd eat that and you know, it was it was good uh, our dentist loved it because you know we got lots of uh, cavities uh, from that okay so let's talk about the pathophysiology for kidney stones what happens is um, crystals are going to form in supersaturated urine and so normally what happens is the the person it's usually a male a younger male uh, they usually don't drink enough fluids, and so their urine gets real concentrated up in the kidneys. And uh, so it forms a supersaturated uh, urine. And then what it takes is a, a little nidus or a seed crystal, a little piece of calcium, oxalate, calcium, struvate. It takes a, a little piece of crystal to, um, to form a, a seed crystal, and then all that supersaturated uh, urine is going to uh, crystallize and it's going to form a stone. And then what happens is as the stone gets bigger and bigger, it gets trapped somewhere in the ureter and somewhere in that uh, urinary tract and it leads to extreme pain. Okay, so um, about 90% of the stones contain calcium and then that calcium it combines with either phosphate, oxalate, struvate, urate, or cysteine. And the reason why this is important is if someone gets lots of uh, kidney stones, what they can do is they can uh, modify their diet. For example, let's say someone gets uh, calcium oxalate uh, stones all the time. What they can do is they can take green leafy vegetables out of their diet and it would help prevent the formation of uh, calcium oxalate stones. So that's why we, we mention that here. Now, the signs and symptoms of uh, kidney stones would be sharp, severe pain. They'll have nausea and vomiting, uh, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. It's because the sympathetic nervous system is kicking in. Uh, they're going to have diaphoresis, anxiety, and hematuria. And you will see, um, you know, grown men, you know, in their 20s, 30s, that will come into the ER, and the pain is so severe that you'll see them pass out because the, the pain is just so severe. And a... A great way to think of, of that, let's go back uh, to these pictures here. So if you could see this uh, jagged stone up here, if you can imagine that stone going through the ureter, and what I envision in my mind is I envision a woman with long fingernails, and she's taking those fingernails and she digs them into the walls of the ureter, and as the urine is pushing that stone down through the track, that uh, those fingernails or those those jagged edges of that stone are tearing or ripping into the wall and that's what's leading to all the pain and uh, so they're going to have hematuria from all that uh, the bleeding and stuff. Now the treatment uh, they're going to give them narcotics because it's extremely painful they're going to give them antispasmodics to decrease the you know the spasms 
they're going to increase the fluid intake and often they're going to try to flush the um, stones out and often they'll increase the uh, urine input you know two to four liters per day and then an uh, important aspect is they're going to strain the urine and i don't know if you can see in the bottom right corner there's a little cone there that has mesh at the bottom and that's what they'll they'll put in the person's bathroom and they'll have big signs up above the toilet and on the door that says strain all urine and so if the um, person voids in a urinal you'll dump the urine through this strainer and if there's any stones in the urine you'll capture that and then you'll send it to the lab and they'll do analysis on that so it's important that you strain all the urine and then like i said if uh, we have a patient that develop stones uh, over and over and over again they are going to send that um, stone to the lab and figure out what type of stone it is and then they can alter their diet to uh, decrease the uh, stone formation in the future and then a, a newer type of treatment is called lithotripsy and i don't know if you can see it over there on the left corner what they do is they put the uh, patient in a, a looks like a big uh, jacuzzi and they shoot ultrasound waves at the stones and they break the stones up and it helps them to uh, to pass the stone. Okay, now we talked about BPH earlier, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through this one. Uh, we talked about it's common in older men, uh, usually greater than 50 to 65 years of age. What happens is the prostate gland enlarges and you have hypertrophy, which means the cells inside the prostate gland enlarge and then you also have hyperplasia and i'm sorry so you have the the cells you're getting larger and there's more cells and what it does is it obstructs the uh, the flow of urine and we talked about the assessment you're going to see that there's uh, increased frequency there's reduced force and strain uh, they they'll dribble when they try to pee they'll be unable to uh, empty the bladder completely they'll strain when they try to urinate to try to push the the urine out and uh, often you're going to see blood in the urine. They'll have uh, nocturia and, and dysuria. We had also talked about that uh, it's diagnosed with a rectal exam. You'll, you'll feel that the uh, prostate gland is enlarged. And they can also do a cystoscopy where they put a scope up in there and they'll see that the, uh, the urethra is being blocked by the prostate gland. Okay, so real quickly we talked about uh, there's alpha blockers that will reduce the uh, smooth muscles or help them to relax. And then there's enzyme inhibitors that prevent the uh, activation or the they'll prevent testosterone from being turned into dihyde or testosterone. And uh, these agents will usually be used first. And then if they no longer work, then they'll go to um, surgery. And uh, so we've, we've talked about a lot of this. Um, the common surgery that they've used for years and years and years is TERP transurethral resection of the prostate that's where they use like electricity or cautery and they go up with a scope and i call it rotorootering out the prostate gland and if you envision that you know there's going to be bleeding in there because they're they're uh, you know cauterizing that there's a balloon dilation where they they stick a balloon in they inflate it there's laser where they go and laser the the prostate gland there's microwave radio waves uh, incisions and also um ultrasound so these are all uh, common types of uh, surgeries that they'll do for this this gentleman oh and a, a kind of a brand new type of uh, treatment if you look up here on the top upper left corner they can also do prosthetic stents and uh, what they do is they they uh, put that in there in the urethra and, and uh, it pushes the the walls of the urethra out so it allows the uh, urine to flow so that's a a newer treatment that you'll see okay and uh, we've talked about this before um, you want to instruct the patient that they're going to have an indwelling catheter for one to two days and it's going to drain blood tinged urine uh, we want to um, tell them that they're going to have a continuous bladder irrigation or cbi and remember we talked about it's a three-way foley uh, in one port uh, is going to have uh, the irrigation of normal saline going into the bladder and it's flushing out the blood clots uh, you have the other port is the bloom port and then the drainage port and that's hooked up to the the um, drainage bag and inside the drainage bag you're going to see blood clots and uh, blood tinged urine as a nurse you want to make sure that you monitor how much urine is coming out into that bag hourly and if it's less than 
than the amount of normal saline going in and um, the amount of urine that they should be making, you know, 30 to 50 milliliters per hour, then you'll need to uh, irrigate that. And what that means is you get a 30 to 50 milliliter syringe, you hook it up to the, uh, the port, and you're going to instill it into the bladder, and then you're going to try to um, withdraw any blood clots that are, are blocking the flow. And then for uh, patients that may have uh, temporary uh, incontinence, you want to teach them Kegel exercises. Okay, and so we talked about this. This is a memory aid that some people will use to remember uh, that. So urothelial cancer. Uh, this is a cancer of the transitional cells in the urinary tract or in the bladder. And um, the pathophysiology is uh, when someone smokes cigarettes, we everyone knows that there's carcinogens inside the uh, the uh, cigarettes. Well, these carcinogens are um, what happens is they will go end up down in the uh, urinary tract, and the uh, carcinogens will come in contact with the transitional cells on uh, the lining of the the bladder, and it will uh, damage the the DNA of those cells, and a tumor will form. And the signs and symptoms of urothelial cancer would be gross painless hematuria. That means that you can actually see the blood, but it's uh, painless. They'll have dysuria, frequency, and urgency. Uh, the, the treatment for that would be um, surgical resection where they remove the, the tumor. Uh, sometimes they'll do a cystectomy where they remove the bladder and then the doctor will uh, produce or make a bladder out of usually a section of bowel. And they try to make it a continent uh, uh, pouch, which means that uh, it, it'll be a reservoir that uh, the patient every three, four hours can go in with a catheter and uh, go in and drain it with a, um, a urinary uh, catheter. And um, so that's called urinary diversion. And then uh, polycystic kidney disease. This is a disorder that uh, it's an inherited disorder where these grape-like cysts are going to replace the normal kidney tissue. Uh, you're going to see two common forms. There's one that is a uh, infantile, and these usually die, you know, at birth. There's an adult form that uh, magically, at 40 years of age, they they uh, diagnose this person, and by the time they're 50, they're in full-blown renal failure. Uh, the pathophysiology. Uh, states that uh, the kidneys are replaced by these non-functioning cysts which uh, displace and compress the normal tissue. Uh, this will lead to uh, high blood pressure because of compression, um, you know, of, of blood flow through the uh, kidneys. And uh, what happens is the renin-angiotensin system kicks in and uh, they're going to have elevated blood pressure. Uh, signs and symptoms, they'll have flank pain, hematuria, proteinuria, dysuria, pyuria, which is pus, nocturia, and it can lead to uh, kidney failure, like I said, by the time they're usually 50 years of age. A treatment, they'll have to do dialysis or a kidney transplant. And then we're going to um, give them pain medications because it's painful with the these uh, cysts compressing all the normal tissue. We'll give them antibiotics to treat the uh, infection. And we want to prevent constipation, and so um, we'll give them stool softers and stuff, and then we'll give them medications to decrease the uh, their blood pressure. And then pyelonephritis, uh, this is an infection of the renal pelvis, and what we're going to see here for the pathophysiology is the microbes will come into the uh, urinary tract, and they will ascend up the ureter up to the um, kidneys, and it leads to an inflammatory response. Uh, scar formation and infection. And uh, the signs and symptoms would be fever, chills, tachycardia, flank pain, frequency, urgency. And the treatment is uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, we're going to give them pain medications. And uh, you want to teach the person to uh, take the full course of antibiotics. We're going to increase the amount of fluids uh, to flush the bacteria out. And we want to monitor for renal failure. And what, what we're concerned about is if someone develops uh, multiple urinary tract infections that get up to the kidneys, it can lead to renal failure if they get multiple uh, ones of these because of the, uh, the scar tissue that is formed. And like we said before, make sure that they finish the course of the antibiotics.